Now, the reason that I like this song so much is, A, it's catchy. I mean, it's just a fun song to sing. It's got an incredible bass line, you guys. Shout out to Candice for always thumping so well on the bass. As a bass guitarist myself, man, I'm always thinking about those lines, and this one's got a good one. But can I tell you what I appreciate most about this song is the lyrics, the message. Because the message of this song is one that we need to be reminded of every single day. Day. If you're unfamiliar with the song, you're going to learn today the message is hey, that battle that you're facing, and come on, we're all facing battles in life. There are all kinds of battles that you and I have to look towards and overcome throughout our daily lives. It might be an interpersonal battle, like there may be somebody that you're beefing with, and you're like, how do I handle this situation? It might be a spiritual battle that you're facing. Maybe you're struggling in your faith, and you're like, boy, this sure feels like I'm in a war in some way. It might be a financial battle. It could be a mental uh, struggle that you find yourself in. We are all facing battles each and every day. So the message of this song is, hey, that battle that you're facing, Christian, you don't have to face it alone. In fact, you weren't designed to face it alone. You were designed to surrender it to God and allow Him to fight for you each and every day. My hope is, as we kick off this worship playlist series, that over the month of August, you come to fall in love more with the worship songs that we do here at Connect. What we're going to be doing every Sunday is we're going to take one of these songs that we sing as a congregation, and we're going to pause, we're going to break it down, we're going to kind of explode it a little bit, go line by line or section by section through the lyrics so that you'll come to understand that, guys, the reason that we sing on Sunday and and the songs that we sing on Sunday, we don't choose them just because they're dope beats and pretty melodies, okay? That's not the reason we choose songs. We choose songs for their theological content because here's the truth. If you will allow worship songs, they can teach you every bit as much as any sermon I might preach on Sundays. Do you guys realize that? Songs, worship songs, are designed to teach you. They're designed to encourage you, designed to help bring you in line with God's will for your life. So we're going to be doing that. Today, we are kicking off this series with, again, one of my favorite songs. This track is called Battle Belongs by an artist named Phil Wickham. Anybody familiar with the song? Maybe you heard it on the radio or you've been around long enough, you sung it with us on Sundays. Um, you, if you pay attention, you're going to notice in the verses of this song, one of which we just sung, you're going to notice that this song sets up up two perspectives. The first perspective is my perspective when I'm facing battles in life, struggles, difficulties, hurdles, situations and things in which I'm just feeling overwhelmed, maybe overcome, and I'm not really sure what the path forward is, okay? Again, we've all been there. We know exactly what that's like. On the other side, we're going to see lyrics that remind us of God's perspective on these same things. We're going to contrast the way that we see life's problems and the way that God sees those very same ones. So let's look at some of the lyrics here. These are some of the lyrics that we find in the verses of this song, consider what it says. When all I see is the battle, God, you see the victory. Hey, when all I see is a struggle, a fight, a war, I'm feeling ill-equipped, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. God, his perspective allows him to see the victory there. When I see a mountain, when I see an insurmountable obstacle, God already has a breakthrough plan. He has a way to move whatever mountain it is that I might be facing in accordance with his will. When I see ashes, God, you see beauty. Think about ashes for a moment. What are ashes? Ashes are what's left over when something is consumed when it's on fire, when it is used up. And usually ashes are representative of destruction and loss. And yet the scripture promises us that even when we see ashes, God can take those ashes and he can exchange them for something beautiful. I don't know about you guys, but I need this reminder, okay? Hey, God can even take a situation like a cross, an instrument of torture and death, and he can turn it into an empty tomb a symbol of victory, a representation of freedom. He can take the worst that humanity can come up with and he can flip the script on it so that victory is the result, so that his perfect plans do come to pass. Hey, have you ever noticed that when life gets tough, we have a tendency to focus on the worst possible outcomes? 
Are you with me? Come on now. This is what the song is kind of highlighting. It's subtle, so you have to examine the lyrics a little bit, but it's so true. I know I'm guilty of this. My guess is you might be as well. When we face life's difficulties, we have a tendency to focus on the worst possible outcomes, right? So like, uh, you know, your boss sends you an email like on Tuesday and says, hey, I want to set up a meeting for Friday. Can you swing by my office at 9 a.m. and we're going to chat? And then, like, what happens? The rest of the week, you're freaking out. You're like, what did I do wrong? And how am I going to pay rent now that I'm clearly getting fired? I mean, why else would he be calling me into his office? The doctor calls. And the doctor says, hey, listen, we noticed on one of your last tests some abnormalities. It's probably nothing. But, like, we're going we're gonna to have you come in. We're going to run some more tests. Don't worry too much. We just want to cover all our bases. You hang up the phone, and where does your mind go? You're like, it's cancer. I know it's cancer. It's all over. Oh, my gosh. The sky is falling. I don't know what it is about us, but our minds just tend to go to the worst case scenarios in every difficult situation. I mean, I've seen people, and they've been in, in a long-term relationship with a boyfriend, a girlfriend, maybe even a spouse, and then the relationship falls apart. And afterwards, their mind just tends to go to this place where they're like, well, I guess I'm never going to have true love. I'm just one of those people. You know, They have the worst possible outcome in mind consistently, anytime things go wrong. I have certainly been there. But what this song wants to remind us of, and what I think the scripture is going to remind us of, we'll see this in a moment, is that although we have an unhealthy tendency to focus on the worst possible outcomes in life, God does not see our situations that we do. You know, the reason that we focus on worst possible outcomes is because we have such a limited vantage point. We have limited knowledge. We have limited perspective. We don't know all the pieces that God might be moving around in our life. And because of our limited perspective, we think, oh, it's all going to fall apart. And God's like, boy, I wish if I could just for a moment, if your mind could handle seeing things from my perspective, you would understand that I have a good and a sovereign plan for you. For every battle, God already has a victory mapped out. For every mountain in your way, God already has a way to move that mountain, okay? In darkness, he provides light. For ashes, he can give you beauty. And listen, he can even turn a cross into an empty tomb. So this wonderful reminder that we have from these lyrics, and we're going to see from a passage of scripture, is that we do not have to fear worst case scenarios in life. That when we have committed ourselves to Jesus, when we have surrendered to our Father in heaven, then we can trust his good and his sovereign plans for our lives. You know, there's this amazing example of this in an Old Testament story. It's a literal battle that's being fought in Judges chapter number 7. In Judges chapter number 7, we learn that the ancient Israelites, so we're talking like 3,000 years ago. This is a long time ago, okay? The ancient Israelites, have uh, they've moved into the promised land after they've been freed from slavery in Egypt. And at first, things are kind of going well. But then a neighboring people group called the Midianites, they start to invade and try to take over the Israelites. And so the Bible tells us in the early parts of the book of Judges, for the better part of 10 years, the Israelites are constantly being raided and being attacked violently by these Midianite people. In fact, we read in Judges chapter 6 that the situation got so bad that the people who lived in border settlements, they were actually abandoning their towns and villages, just leaving their house behind. They were fleeing into the mountains and they were hiding in caves so that they wouldn't be conquered and taken away as slaves. Like this was a really, really tough battle, like a literal battle that these guys were facing. And it's in the middle of this circumstance that God raises up a guy named Gideon. Gideon Gideon is a, he's kind of a famous character from scripture. He's got a prominent role here in the book of Judges. And I want to talk to you a little bit about his story beginning in Judges chapter number seven. Let's read beginning in verse one. The scripture says, the armies of Midian were camped north of Gideon and his army in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, then the Israelites will boast to me that they have saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever's timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of his warriors went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. Oh my goodness, you guys. Now listen, I, I I would never deign to tell God anything, okay? But listen... It's almost like God doesn't know that if you're going to go fight a literal war, you need as many soldiers as you can possibly have, right? I mean, from an earthly perspective, it's better to have a bigger army than a smaller army. And yet, God cuts Gideon's army by two-thirds, just like that. 
So you might think now, it's like, okay, now take these two-thirds or take this one-third that's left and go fight the battle. But the Lord in verse 4 told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, here's what you're going to do, Gideon. I want you to divide these guys into two groups. In the first group, put all those who kneel down and cup water with their hands and then lap it up with their tongues. In the other group, I want you to put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths directly in the stream. The scripture tells us that only 300 of the men drank from their hands. The other, I, don't, I can't even do math, 9,700 of these men, they got down on their knees and just put their face directly in the water. So at this point, if you're unfamiliar with the story, you're probably like, okay, God is probably going to say to Gideon, all right, Gideon, you don't need those 300. They're bad warriors. They would have been cannon fodder anyway. So send those jokers home. You've still got 9,700 warriors left to go fight this battle with. But that's not what God does. Instead, check this out. Verse 7, the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors, and he sent them home. But he kept those 300 men with him. Oh, my goodness. This story gets so good. It starts great, and it gets even better as we go. But could you just imagine for a moment how Gideon must have been feeling in this circumstance? If he hadn't been worried about worst-case scenarios before... You've got to imagine that he was worried about worst case scenarios now. He's got to be thinking to himself, God, we were going to struggle to win this battle when there were 30,000 of us, and now there's 300. You've cut back our army by more than 90%. What in the world are we going to do? How in the world could we see a victory in such a dire and desperate sort of circumstance? He must have been feeling really overwhelmed, but God had a reason for what he did. More importantly than God having a reason, God had a plan. He had a purpose that he was about to work out amongst the Israelites through Gideon and his 300 men. And he was going to show the world what he is capable of to a small group of people that are completely yielded to him. We're going to talk a little bit about what God's plan was, and I promise you it's really cool. But before we do that, our worship team is actually going to come back on stage, and they're going to lead us through the next section of Battle Belongs. You're going to stay in your seat, and if you want to sing along, great. But I'm going to encourage you to meditate on these lyrics in light of the truth that we're reading from Judges 7. incredible reminder that although we might find ourselves in the battle, we're not responsible for the battle. God is the one who is ultimately responsible for the outcome of every circumstance and situation in the world. Do you realize this? This is what we mean when we talk about God being sovereign. Sovereign is a word that means he is fully and completely in control at all times. Hey, listen, it might feel like your life is out of control, but it can never be out of control when God is in control. There is no circumstance that can stand against our God. A mountain might seem insurmountable to you, but remember, we talked a few months ago about the fact that God can move a mountain as easily as we might move a mustard seed. And so we have this God who is sovereign, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he is always good. What a great reminder. So... If the battle belongs to God, 
then I get to kick back and take it easy, right? Like I just get to, I get to chill, kick up my feet, watch some Netflix, eat some Cheetos, and just wait for God to do what God does, right? That's it. I, I'm going to take my hands off. Jesus, take the wheel. You're in control. I trust you. Not exactly. What we find out in the scriptures is that although we're not responsible for the outcome of the battle, we are responsible for our role within the battle. Yeah. That like God doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to take care of all this. You sit back and let me do this for you. Enjoy your vacation. God is always calling his people to engage in his work in the world. You realize that. You have a plan and a role to play in God's plan, whether it's a worldwide history-making plan or it's the plan for your little clump of cubicles in the office. You have a role to play in all of it. The key here is that while I may need to fight, I'm not going to fight the way the world fights. We're going to see this in the song and we're going to see this in the scripture we're going to fight as believers. And hey, there are things that are worth fighting for as believers. There are things that God calls us to go to battle over. But when we go to battle, we are going to do it not according to the flesh. We're going to fight our battles according to the spirit. We're not going to resort to violence and arguing and all of those different things. Instead, we are going to rely on on the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the ways of the Spirit in order to accomplish the purposes of our Father in the world. Now, this is exactly what Gideon had to learn as the battle kicks off in Judges chapter number 7. We'll read in verse 15. Watch this. Gideon shouted to his men, regulators, mount up. I'm a 90s kid. I don't know what you want me to say. And it's like I said in the first, it's not even my first, it's not even my last 90s reference, frankly. I'm going to make another one before we get done. Okay, Gideon says to his men, gather up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided the 300 men into three groups, and he gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. And then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. And as soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, blow your horns too all around the entire camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Now, it was just past midnight after the changing of the guard when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly, they blew the ram's horns and they broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hand and the horns in their right hands, and they shouted for the Lord and for Gideon. Verse 21, we read, each man stood at his position around the camp. And he watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their own swords. And those who were not killed fled to the furthest parts of the region. Do you understand what these verses are telling us here? Gideon is going into a literal battle, and he is completely outmatched. He doesn't have the number of people that he needs. He's got 301 people in his army, and he's going up against a nation that has tens of thousands of fighting men that are ready to go, all right? I know we've all seen 300, and we're like, oh, 300 men can definitely... It doesn't work that way usually. Not only that, but we, we read in other parts of this uh, section of scripture that the Midianites were very advanced and sophisticated from a military perspective. So they had the best armor, they had the sharpest swords, they had chariots and horses, which were like ancient battle tanks, you know what I mean? In, in every single way, Gideon was in a bad position. Like Gideon is going to fight this war and these verses tell us that the men have in their hands trumpets and torches. Where are their swords? Where are the grenades, you guys? Can you imagine going to fight like a Braveheart-style battle and you bring with you a kazoo and a candle? That's what Gideon and his men have in their hands. They have a kazoo and a candle for all intents and purposes. But wait now, I told you God has a sovereign plan. There is something that he is going to do in this moment. Everybody would have thought, Gideon probably thought, God, we are about to get completely routed. There is no way out of this situation. This is a battle that I cannot win. But we read, we read a moment ago about how God specifically chose to send the, uh, the Israelites into battle against Midian with fewer people than they should have gone with 
and with worse technology or, or um, armor and, and, and swords and things like that than they should have. He did that on purpose, and he tells us why. He wants it so that when the Israelites win this battle, despite the fact that they're outgunned, outclassed, and outmatched, when they win this battle, he wants everyone to say, it is the Lord that gave them victory. He doesn't want anybody to say, well, you know, the Israelites, they've always been good swordsmen. And so, yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense that like 300 were able to hold off 30,000. No, he wants everybody to say the Lord is with them. The Lord is good to his people. He has provided a way where there seems to be no way whatsoever. In fact, we get to the very end of the story. We're not going to read it today, but if you get to the end of this story, uh, Midian... uh, Gideon is having a a conversation with the Israelites, and he basically says to them, hey, guys, don't get confused here. Gideon did not deliver you. God is the one who gave you victory today. The battle is not mine. The battle is not yours. The battle is not ours. The battle always belongs to our good and sovereign Father in heaven. This is so instructive for us because once you realize that the battle is ultimately God's responsibility, it doesn't mean that you disengage and you do nothing. Instead, it means that although you will have to fight, you're not going to fight the world's way. Rather than swinging a sword like the world does, we're going to sing a song. Hey, can I tell you something? That swinging a sword can kill a soldier, but singing a song can defeat an entire army. We see it right here. There is power when we approach our difficulties with God's perspective in mind instead of our limited human perspective. There are breakthroughs and miracles. You will see changes in your family. You will see your workplace shift in a better direction when God's people choose to walk into a situation and say, I'm going to do this his way and not the world's way. Christians are going to fight battles. Guys, we got to fight some battles in the world we're in today, but we've got to fight in the ways of God with the means of Jesus. So rather than swinging a sword, we're going to sing a song. Rather than arguing until you're blue in the face, let me show you what I think, Facebook friend. (laughs) We're going to pray. Hey, can I tell you something? You're clever. I I know you're clever. And I know you've got like all the evidence to back up your position and all that sort of stuff. But like if you genuinely want to change somebody, the most effective thing you can do for them is to pray for them. Boy, we have like marital counseling, you know, and people come in and say, man, we're really struggling. Maybe a wife is like, oh, my husband, he really needs to. And I'm like, hey, listen, hey, I, I get it. He probably does need to change. But, but how often are you praying for him? Oh, no, I don't need to pray for him. He needs to change. Somebody needs to talk to this man, okay? Um, listen, praying for someone or praying over a situation is literally the most effective thing that you can possibly do to change that situation. Have we not seen that here at Connect Church? When we needed a place, we prayed. When we needed resources, oh, God, we're broke, help us. We prayed. And God showed up in powerful and miraculous ways. We're going to fight some battles. You are going to fight some battles in life, in the Christian life. But we're going to fight in the ways of Jesus so that we can see the blessings of God on our battles. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul had in mind. When he wrote in, uh, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verses 3 through 4, he says this. He says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. He says, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds and to destroy whatever is false. My friends, if you have a stronghold in your life, there is something that you are like, God, I need this mountain moved. I need this battle. I need some victory in it. If you have a stronghold in your life, the way that you will find victory in that stronghold is through surrender to God. It is through God's ways, his weapons, fighting battles in, in the spirit rather than in the flesh, this is where the victory comes through. Your kids are believing something false, you know, maybe they're chasing after something the world's told them or they're believing something about their identity and you want to do something about it. Listen, don't scream at them. Don't spank them. Like literally pray for them, serve them, love them. I'm not saying don't ever spank you. I'm, don't even get into that. Okay. I'm afraid somebody's going to send me an email. Do you think it's wrong? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not a parent. I don't know. What we do, though, is we see the battle that we're in, and we say, okay, I know my flesh wants to respond this way. I know there's a part of me that wants to swing, (laughs) but I'm not going to do that 
because I'm a Jesus person, and Jesus gave me a different way. God said, listen, we're human, but we don't fight like humans. When we go to war, we don't go to war with the weapons of the world. We go to war with the weapons of the Spirit. It is the weapons of the Spirit that will give breakthrough. It's the weapons of the Spirit that will bring transformation. Too many of us have not experienced the sorts of miracles and breakthroughs that we see in the Scripture because we're trying to fight the wars as the world does. We're relying on political power to accomplish our objectives. Uh Uh-oh. Some of us just straight resort to violence, you know? (laughs) You know, I was thinking this this week about the eminent philosopher Ice Cube. Anybody familiar? (laughs) I told you, it's not my last 90s reference. Um, I was thinking about Ice Cube. And, and he's got this song that I used to sing a lot when I was a kid. Don't sing it now for obvious reasons. But anyway, the, the song ends in which he says, I didn't even have to use my AK. I guess today was a good day, right? In his mind, as long as the day doesn't end in violence, then it's been a good day. And I got to tell you, like, I agree with Cube that, like, not shooting somebody is probably an important ingredient to having a good day, okay? But listen now, the reason I bring that up is because there are a lot of Christians, and they carry around that same mindset. And they think, okay, God has told me that I'm supposed to fight this battle. And the way I'm going to fight this battle is, and they rely on the weapons of the world. They rely on the ways of our culture. And God says, hey, listen, if you're one of my followers, I have given you a new way to engage in battle. I have given you a new way to deal with the difficulties that you might face, all right? And so um, I want you to notice what this lyric says, and then I'm going to point you again towards the scripture. The lyric that we read in the chorus said, so when I fight, again, you're going to fight. When I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Now I want you to think about this position for just a moment. If I were to get into a fist fight like this, I'm going to be on my knees and I'm going to keep my hands high. And then let's go. I'm not in a good position, am I? This is not an aggressive position for sure. This is not even a defensive position, is it? This is a position of surrender. Ah, So this is the key. When it comes to fighting our battles and fighting them God's way, the key to victory lies in surrender. The key to victory lies in surrender. This is one of those upside down things in God's economy where he calls his people to act in ways that are contrary to common sense and everything our dads taught us growing up, you know. It's like, no, no, no. We gain victory when we fully surrender. Wait a sec. No, no, no. If you want to win a battle, God, you better have the bigger army. You might want to have the sharper swords. You need to be bigger, stronger, faster, and meaner than the other people. That's how you get back. That's how you get victory, but not in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, we gain victory through surrender, not surrender to our enemies, not surrender to the world's agenda, not surrender to everything people say on social media or in interviews and things like that. We surrender to God. When we surrender ourselves to our sovereign father's good and perfect plan, we will see victory. This is what the song's teaching us. This is precisely what Gideon discovered in the scripture. When he did it God's way, victory was to be found. Even though it was completely backwards from what you might have expected, it wasn't the way that Gideon would have chosen. It was because he was willing to surrender to God that God demonstrated his power to deliver and save in that situation. If we are followers of Jesus, we have to follow the example of Jesus. I want to give you two from his life very quickly. One's particular and one's a little broader. We read in the Gospels that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Roman guards show up and they're trying to slap the cuffs on Jesus. You remember the story? One of his disciples, a guy named Peter, Peter the fisherman, okay, he pulls a sword out of his belt. Whooshing, And he's like, for Jesus and God! And he attacks the soldiers with a sword. And Jesus rebukes Peter. And he says, Peter, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Basically what he communicates, both in that moment and throughout the rest of the night, is that he came to fight a battle. 
There is a battle that Jesus came to fight. The battle wasn't against people. The battle was against sin. The battle was against the, our tendency to rebel against God and screw the world up as we try to remake it in our own image. Jesus said, I have come to fight a battle. But hear me now. His victory is not going to come through a revolution. His victory is going to come through a resurrection. You see? He's going to go through the cross on Good Friday. And it's going to seem like the enemy has won. It's going to feel like he surrendered to the wrong way. That he's lost. That somehow God's plan has failed. But we'll find out on Easter Sunday, as we read the good news, that God can take any situation and he can turn it for good. That there is no battle that cannot be overcome with his power and with his blessing on it. This is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Surrender to God. Nowhere is this more true than when it comes to our salvation. You realize that, right? Like the whole point of being a Christian. Like God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to save you. I'm going to give you salvation as a reward for good behavior. That's not how it works. In fact, we read in Ephesians chapter number two, God says that salvation is not a work that we do. We don't earn it. Instead, it is a gift that's given freely because of God's mercy and his grace. That passage actually ends by echoing something that we heard in Judges chapter number 7. Remember in Judges 7, God said, I don't want to send you into battle with this many warriors because I don't want anybody to say they saved themselves, right? And then in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9, we read this, that salvation is not of our own achievement. Why? So that no one can boast. God is the one who brings victory in every one of your battles. He has brought victory in the greatest battle that any of us might face, the battle against sin. And if he has given us victory and deliverance there, why can't we trust him to deal with that difficult person in HR? Why can't we trust him to, to believe that his ways when it comes to finances are better? Why is it that we can't fight battles the way that God calls Christians to do it if we would, we genuinely would see some great victory. But it's not going to happen through our own achievement. It's going to happen when we receive God's ways and his favor in our lives. The worship team's going to lead us through this final section that the bridge of battle belongs. Again, you're going to stay in your seat. They're going to lead you. And I want you to think about these lyrics in light of what God is revealing. everything together, okay? God does call you to engage and fight appropriately. That means fighting in the spirit 
instead of fighting in the flesh or fighting according to the world's standards. Let's end our message by getting specific, maybe a little personal, because it's easy to talk in generalities about God winning a battle, and it's easy to talk about a guy that lived 3,000 years ago, but when we start to think about how this applies to our daily lives, how this will impact you in the coming days, I think that's where the real rubber meets the road. That's where God wants us to get with the scriptures. Uh, We don't just fill our minds, but actually we go out and we live the truths of what we've heard on Sunday. So let's start by acknowledging what battle you're facing right now. Go ahead, just let it come to mind. We have this, we have this tendency to kind of like hide or bury the battles and difficulties, the things that are freaking us out in life. We want to bury it in the back of our mind and not acknowledge it. That's the exact wrong thing to do. You cannot acknowledge something that you won't, you can't address something that you won't acknowledge. Are you with me? You can't address it until you acknowledge it. We have to confess what it is that we're going through. And so um, I, I want you to think like, what is stressing me out right now? What is that thing? Who is stressing me out right now? Who is that person that I just keep thinking to myself, oh man, if I didn't see them at all in the next month, I would be one happy guy. Uh, What's keeping you up at night? What do you lay in bed thinking about? 2 a.m., you wake up and it's always there on your mind. Go ahead and acknowledge it and then start to see it, not from your perspective as like this, I have no idea what to do and how am I ever going to find a breakthrough here? Instead, remind yourself of the fact that God sees it differently. He's got a perspective, a good and sovereign perspective that you don't. So we're going to acknowledge what it is that we're facing. And then we're going to confess, God, this battle belongs to you. Like this week when you're praying, and, and listen, you should be praying on your own specifically over the things that you've got going on in your life, the battles that you're facing. Remember, the best thing you can do, the most effective thing you can do is to pray in your situation. So as you're praying, remind yourself, confess, God, this battle belongs to you. Guys, I mean that like literally. Say those, let's say those words together, all right? God, this battle belongs to you. Let's say it one more time now that we all know what's going on. God, this battle belongs to you. There is power in that confession. When you speak truth to your soul, when you calm your mind with the word and the spirit, there is something that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep you, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we're going to confess or acknowledge what we're going through. We're going to speak this truth. God, the battle belongs to you. And then we're going to engage. We're going to fight. Listen, we're going to fight for our marriages. We're going to fight for our kids. We're going to fight for what's right and good in the world. We're going to fight, but we're not going to do it in the ways of the world. We're going to do it in the ways of the Spirit. We are going to fight, but we're going to fight the way God tells us to. So we are going to pray. We're going to sing. Can I pause for a moment? Oh, man. Okay, I I have a minute or two. I'm actually ahead of schedule for once today, so I got a moment to chase this tangent. You know the reason that we're doing this worship playlist series is because music has untapped power in your life. Are you with me? Music has power that too many of us Christians ignore. Now listen, it's never going to have the power of Scripture. I don't mean to intimate that, but it does have power. There's this incredible story in the Old Testament. We might actually teach this as a part of one of our Sunday uh, messages this month. There's an Old Testament story in which there's a king named Saul. And the Bible says he falls into a funk, like a deep depression. Actually, what the scripture says is he's demonically afflicted, but hey, whatever. He's in a bad mood. And there's this kid named David who comes along, like the same David who fought Goliath. He's like a young teenager. He hasn't fought the giant yet. He shows up at the palace. He brings his harp, and he plays the music, and that music soothes Saul, and the demon departs from him. Okay? Now listen, we don't have any harps here at Connect, okay? Uh, The harp doesn't really strike me as a particularly powerful instrument. Like, I'm like, what's up? Let's get a bass guitar. What can that accomplish? But the point is, music has power. And I'm afraid too often Christians kind of overlook this aspect of, of encountering God, having a daily quiet time, or hey, even being a part of corporate worship. If I can just be direct, one of the reasons that we decided, actually the the real impetus that kind of led us to do this series is that we noticed that many people on Sundays hang out in the lobby until the music is over, and then they come find their seats as the message is starting. 
Now, listen, I don't know who this is because I'm up here and I'm facing the screen, so I never see it. But people are like, man, there's a lot of folks that just walk in late. So if I'm talking to you, I'm not like, hey, sister in the back, you need to pay attention. No, no, I don't know who you are. But hey, if the Lord kind of says, hey, he's talking about you right now, then that's between you and him. Okay, so maybe, maybe you say, well, listen, worship is not my jam. Like, I just, I don't get it, you know? Like, I don't even go to concerts where we sing out loud, you know, to, I, I was going to say some, like, you know, country artist, but I don't even have one. So anyway, um, <laughs> I've never listened to country music in my life. Anyway, um, so you say, like, I just don't sing. This is weird to me. Why do you guys do it? We do it because there's power in it. We do it because the the words and the lyrics, they actually inform, they shape us. Do you realize for two millennia, going back to the very beginning, the Christian church has always sung as a way to communicate truth. Singing has power to shape you and to inform you in the things of God. This is why with little kids, we teach them to sing their ABCs instead of just memorizing their ABCs. Because when you put it to music, it's a little bit easier to stick with you. Same thing with gospel truth. When we sing the battle belongs, it has a way of lodging in our minds. It has a way of finding home and root in our spirit so that when we go out and we find ourselves in the middle of the battle, that truth is there. The Holy Spirit can illuminate that truth both from song and from scripture and give you what you need to walk in victory every single day. So my challenge to you is like, don't skip one of the most important things we do here on Sunday. Do you realize if you skip out on worship because it's like too loud or it's not your style or you don't know the songs or you think singing is weird, whatever, if you skip on this, you will be spiritually deficient. In the same way that somebody that only ate like one type of food and never any other type of food, they would be nutritionally deficient. You will be spiritually deficient if you don't have a worship component in your life. And I'm specifically even talking about musical worship. Worship is much more than music, but it is certainly not less than music. And so we want you to engage in these songs in a new way, to see the truth and the beauty and the scriptural foundation behind them. But more than that, I want you to allow these words to help shape you into the person that God wants you to be and get you set to set you on the right track. So we're going to acknowledge, we're going to confess, we're going to fight. That might include praying, singing. It could include um, serving or sleeping. Hey, this is a big one. If you believe the battle is God's and you're not responsible for the outcome, then like, like we talked about in our Sabbath series a while back, Christians should be sleeping like babies every single night. What do we have to fear? There's an almighty fortress that goes before us. There's nothing that can stand against the power of our God. You might have 30,000 on your side, but me and the Lord is all it takes. So we're going to fight in the ways of Jesus. Ultimately, what it's going to come down to is we're going to surrender to God. The more you surrender to God, the easier life gets. Yeah, it brings its own difficulties and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But just frankly, the best life you can live is one that is lived in full and complete surrender to God. So we're going to acknowledge, we're going to confess, we're going to fight in the ways of Jesus. And then, hey, look, I'm just going to be straight with you. Encourage yourself, remind yourself of the truth of John 16, 33. This is our Lord Jesus speaking. He says this, I have told you these things. I've told you the things that I've been communicating this whole time I've been here. I've told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Some people come to Jesus and they're like, oh, well, life's going to be easy after that. Mm." It's not. He doesn't magically make all your problems disappear. He says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. There will be battles that you have to fight, but take heart. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. You don't have to overcome the world. You're not responsible for fixing every problem. You're not responsible for saving every soul. You're not responsible for having every answer. That's not it. If we surrender to the one who does, however, we will start to see things shift in the, in, on earth, really, as it is in heaven.